Well, hello and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you as ever from Vitality Stadium. Our job here is to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club throughout the course of the season. Now, for those of you who are new to our podcast, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. As ever, I'm of course joined by my colleague Neil Perrett, who has been covering the Cherries for 30 years and has quite literally seen it all. Neil, we're back for the new year. We're hoping for a very exciting 2022. Have you recharged your batteries? Oh, those batteries went flat years ago, Zoe, I'm afraid <laughs> to say. But uh, yeah, really looking forward to, to an exciting 2022. Absolutely. Well, talking of exciting, we've got a really exciting guest on our podcast today. It's a man who signed for the club in the summer and recently scored his first career hat-trick with the Cherries. He's a very popular member of the squad and absolutely loved by supporters. So without further ado, we are delighted to welcome our very own Emiliano Marcondes onto the AFC Bournemouth podcast. Emmy, it's great to see you. It's it's great to have you here. How have you been? Yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, I feel feel good at the moment. Um, I feel fit. Yeah. Well, we've got absolutely tons to get through. But first things first, we're going to go right back to the beginning because your experiences during your younger days have certainly defined you here and now and, and later in life. Firstly, though, we're intrigued to know about your name and how it's made up. Emiliano Marcondes Camargo Hansen. Just talk us talk us through that. Um, yeah, first of all, Emiliano is actually an Italian name. Um, and that was my mom uh, who came up with that. It's also uh, people in Brazil have that name as well, but she got it from from uh, uh, some she knew, she knew in, uh, in Italy. And uh, my dad was keen to that. And uh, then her second name is uh, Marcondes Camargo. And my dad's second name is uh, Hansen. So, yeah, I got, got all the names. Let's start where it all began, Emmy. Tell us about your upbringing from what you can remember, really young age. Um, yeah, I'm I'm born in Denmark and I I grew up uh, most of my life in in Denmark, Copenhagen, um, with my mom and dad um, the first couple of years. And we actually, when I was two and uh, five years old, we travelled to Brazil and I lived there. Uh, for half a year each time, uh, nine months when I was two years old. So it, that was actually my my first language that I could speak. But it was, you know, baby language, so I could speak some of the words. Uh, so not fluidly, but it was my first words were in Portuguese. Um, and then uh, my parents got divorced when I was around seven, eight, uh, and my mom moved back to Brazil, and. Uh, yeah, I grew up with my dad, um, and uh, yeah, she she lived uh, in, in Brazil, and uh, um, yeah, that's that's in in a bigger um, story. Yeah, that's the that's the small small story. What was that like for you as a youngster growing up, dividing your time between Denmark and Brazil? Um, I felt I felt. Uh, a bit special, if you can say that. My me and my brother was uh, Brazilian and and Danish, and my dad was he loved football, and uh, it made me fall in love with football as well. And he was talking a lot about the Brazilian players, and uh, were like comparing me to to the Brazilian players, and I think that made me fall in love with football. Um, um, yeah, um, so that made me feel a bit special in in school and in the kindergarten uh, that I was I felt like a, a connection to the Brazilian players uh, and and uh, the Danish uh, people in in Denmark I went to school where they were uh, they were just Danish if, if you can say that just starting with your mum just just tell us a little bit more about your mum you were very candid in your first interview with the club when you signed you told us about some of the problems that she had with alcohol, mental health. Just just tell us what you can and what you want to tell us about her. Um, yeah, there's, of course, uh, uh, it's a big story and, and some of it I want to, to keep for myself. Uh, um, but the things I can say is I, I what I remember of, of my, uh, when I was growing up was 
that uh, it was most my dad that was taking care of me and and my brother and uh, and uh, yeah she she had a problem with alcohol and uh, she missed her family uh, in her in Brazil uh, and it was a uh, it was co- a quite difficult for her to get used to the Danish culture uh, where we are a bit more structured and uh, in Brazil is a bit more chilled and uh, probably a bit more uh, party style and that's what she came from that that kind of vibe and and uh, yeah I think she she missed her family and and uh, and the the easy way for her uh, or to get out of those thoughts she was she was drinking and uh, and uh, I I didn't see it or I didn't understand it when I was young but now when I have have grown grown and uh, got more uh, thoughtful about it that's that's how I, how I see it now and I was growing up with with my dad uh, that's uh, for for most of the times so even with my dad or or alone because my my dad had to had to work uh, to to get some some money so we we could uh, have something to eat. Now you already said that she moved back to Brazil. I think you were about nine years old when she she moved back to Brazil. Now when you did a program Q and A for us earlier this season, you said that your biggest regret was not travelling to Brazil to see your mum before she passed away. And I think you were seventeen then. Just just tell us that must have really struck with you. Um, yeah, it's it's a. Uh it's something that I, I remember when when she passed her away that uh, I was thinking about football all the time and I was I just had my first training with with the first team in the FC Norseland at that time and uh, and uh, you know everything happened so quickly and I didn't I didn't really uh, think about uh, going to Brazil to to see her because uh, you know I was thinking I will, I will do it in the future um but then out of nowhere uh, my cousin or actually my mom's sister they called us in in Denmark to to my dad and said we have to come to Brazil now because uh, my mom is in coma and uh, it can't be the last time we will see her and then uh, that was late in the night and then the day after we we were talking about okay we're gonna get a flight uh, I went to training and then after training, uh, my dad called me and said, "We we are not going anyway because uh, she she already passed away." So, we we stayed uh, in Denmark, and you know, with Catholics, uh, how they uh, do with when someone passed away, they uh, bury the 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 body within 24 hours. So we couldn't even be there to the funeral. Um, so that was something I I regret that I. I didn't take a bit more charge uh, of of the situation, or uh, why why I didn't like said okay I wanna I wanna see her and my family, uh, even though it was it was difficult with to get to Brazil is is far away and uh, it cost a lot of money and we we didn't have we didn't have much. Uh, um, so we will have, we would have to to uh, loan uh, some money uh, somewhere, but still to to try to make it happen, I didn't. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how I I felt, and I know it was I'm, I was young, and I don't uh, I'm not being too trying to be too hard on myself anymore. I think you've spoken before about your brother as well. When you were younger, he had some mental health problems as well that must have made the situation quite difficult for you as well what what do you remember of that and, and again what are you happy to, to talk about that um yeah that's something i i can uh, remember uh, a lot more of because i have been living with uh, uh, a brother who have been uh, mentally mentally sick do you call it that in english yeah um he have had schizophrenia and, and paranoia since uh, yeah, since I can remember. Since you we were ten years old, uh, I was ten and he was he was fourteen. Um, so that's that's like how I. Uh, but for me, me it was just my brother. So I didn't really see it as a as a 
sickness in him. Uh, I, I just got used to it. And uh, again, it was when I got older and I, I start to to uh, try to do a bit more and, and take a bit more time. And also when my mom passed away, I tried to to take more care of, uh, care of him and, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, take a lot of responsibility <laughs> on my shoulders and people with uh, with uh, mental sickness in their family, they know that they it feels like uh, you always can do something and and uh, it's your it's your problem or your default or you it's because of you they are sick and uh, that has been hard for for both me and and especially my dad uh, that's something i keep thinking about is it's been very tough for my dad uh, and i uh yeah i'm really proud of him that he that he have been been through this and and being so positive and also trying to keep me out of most of, of the things especially with my mom I have to ask how how is your brother now? Do you get to see much of him? Does he come to games? Um, now, uh, no, he he can't he can't travel uh, at the moment, and uh, he live in a in a center uh, for people with mental sickness, um, and uh, yeah, that's that's how it is uh, at the moment, and. Uh, um, yeah, I don't want to go too much in detail, but that's that's how we have lived uh, for the last last few years. Now, for you, you've obviously been through what you've been through, but you have such a positive outlook on life. Do you think, you know, these events have sort of shaped your personality? I mean, you're always smiling, you're always happy, you're joking around the training ground. Do you think certain events have, have shaped that personality, or is it something that you've always had? Um, I don't know if I if I always smile. I try to, uh, but it's something I think about. I try to to be happy and and I try to to put a smile on on people's face uh, as much as I can. Um, and yeah, m- maybe have have shaped me the things I have been through and and uh, I try to also uh, like be the best version or be better. Uh, um, at anything uh, in my life and, and progress and develop um, because that's that's uh, yeah, how my mentality has always been that I want to, to achieve things and I want to be better and I want to help people to get better and uh, um, yeah so so maybe that's why uh, it can also be, be other things where I have uh, been in a young culture in, in academy in in Norseland that have uh where have been raised uh i've used all my time there so it can be yeah many things that have uh, uh shaped me i mean you've spoken a lot about your mum and about your brother just tell us a little bit more about your dad your relationship with them now i think wikipedia says that he's is or was a jazz musician just tell us is that true for a start uh, it is true. Yes, he have uh, he have played uh, salsa and jazz music, and that's how he met my mother actually in in Brazil. And uh, um, yeah, my me and my dad's relationship is is better now. Actually, after I moved uh, from Denmark to England, it's like we have a, a stronger connection now. Um, when I was in Denmark, we we didn't talk that much. Uh, my dad is is not a um, uh, he's a man with few words uh, and and a bit like me not talking that much or not talking so fast and uh, a bit quiet sometimes. But uh, um, yeah, after I moved away from Denmark, we we start to call each other more and uh, um, yeah, maybe also I I, I think about uh, when with my mom. That I have to remember to to call him and and uh, try to uh, gain or keep the the connection there uh, because uh, you you never know what's gonna happen in in life. Did he teach you to play any musical instruments at all? No, no, he didn't. <laughs> Unfortunately, not. Uh, I always said to him he he should have uh, taught me something because I love music and. Uh, 
And uh, I think it's easier for a kid to to learn that. But he actually he he tried with my my brother, and he probably uh, played a bit more than when we were younger. And uh, um, I was because he always had drums and and guitars in in the in the house. And uh, I was I was more about to try to hit them with my football. So <laughs> um, it was not something that I really really. Uh, got me when I was younger. I, I actually start to do play piano now because the house I, I'm renting, there is a piano, so, and my girlfriend is playing piano, so she tried to teach me. That's, that's fascinating because uh, Nathan Aki, who was here, learnt, started learning the piano when he was here, and by the time he'd left, he was like Liberace or so Richard Clayderman or something like that. It was incredible. You aspire to be really good on the piano I would imagine um I'm not that good I'm not that good it's difficult but uh I'm trying I'm trying I have I actually have a when when I was younger I went to drum lessons as well to play drum and uh it was also a bit my dad he said that I, that I should do it uh um so I have a drum set at home now as well my girlfriend got me that for for Christmas so now I have a drum set and a piano in in one room and uh yeah i'm trying i can play a little bit but it's just the basics you know i'm I'm not i'm not very good uh, on the piano i can only play three songs and that is uh adele uh someone like you is it called that yeah, yeah. Uh, and then rihanna i can't even remember what what's the name is and jason Mraz with i'm yours that's that's the three songs so is it fair to say that you could have a career in busking in Bournemouth Town Centre one day? No, 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 no. It's, it's right now it's just, I find it kind of relaxing when I come home and I, uh, not doing uh, just the same every day, watching a movie or uh, reading a book, then I can kind of mix it up with, with also doing something creative. Um, and it's actually something I have I have read about to do something to keep my mind uh, creative at home as well. Um, then also on on the football pitch. I was going to say we haven't really asked you anything about football yet, no. so let, let's fire a football question yeah. at you because you are a footballer. How did it all start for you, football wise? Um, well, it, it started when I could could walk. Uh, yeah, I played straight away uh, and in a small club in Copenhagen uh, called Vidor. Um And uh, yeah, my, my dad was always uh, playing with me or, or not holding me back. Uh, so when I was playing on the streets or uh, in the garden, he was, he was never saying, now you have to come in to eat. He was always just, he was leaving me out all day and and uh, also when I got older, when I had to train, he he always uh, let me do my my stuff and didn't stress about me doing other th- other stuff. So I used a lot of time, and I re- it was I was just uh, yeah in love in love with football playing all the time. And then when I was fourteen, I uh, got scouted to FC Nordsjælland to the academy. Uh, me and, and a friend from, from Vidor, we went together up there. And uh, I don't think I would have gone there if, if my friend was not going, because I was, I was quite happy to be in, in, the, in Vidor. But uh, looking back now, I was really happy that I made that decision, because uh, Ipsen Orsland Academy is, is wonderful and is uh, amazing. And uh, yeah, probably one of the, one of the best uh, in in Europe maybe or it is the best one in Denmark I would say and uh, yeah still a lot of players coming from from that academy after everything that you had been through as a child and were still going through as a 14 year old I mean that must have been a real confidence booster for you and it was almost I would have thought like like an escape from from life football yeah it's it's funny you say that because that's that's how I felt uh, it's always how how I felt when I had problems uh, at home or when my parents were fighting or uh, if it was with my brother. There was I was always just taking the ball under my arm. I went 
in the garden or went on my bike, went down to to Vidor, to to the pitches there and just played alone. And uh, it kept me happy and motivated that one day it will be it will be you know nice and it will I will be this professional footballer that that uh, have a have a wonderful life and and that was how I was motivated I was so I was visualizing uh, when I was playing alone always and uh, scoring goals and celebrating and and looking around if someone saw me uh, because I was alone and I was just playing uh, and celebrating alone so it was uh, a moment uh, that was like football was was driving. It was the driver, and uh, of course, uh, it made me made me happy when when a club uh, um, Norseland came. Uh, but I was I was still a bit uh, insecure of if it was the right decision because I was I was thinking I should go from from the small club to a big club in in. A, in England or Spain, or I was very uh, maybe a bit unrealistic, but I was dreaming big. Um, um, yeah, and I, re- I remember in school actually, uh, one of my teachers, uh, because I always had this dream about I'm gonna be a footballer. Not there's nothing else, and always in school when people ask uh, if you're not gonna be a footballer, what are you gonna be? But I didn't have an answer. I didn't know. You know, a lot of my friends that played football, they were saying, "I'm, I'm maybe be a, a policeman or a firework or whatever." Um, but I never, I never knew what what I was gonna say. And I tried to say, "I'm a policeman." Can that be me? Yes, it can't. I can only be uh, a footballer. And and so my answer was always, "Then I would not be me." And my teacher always said, "But you have to." I remember we have to write an essay about what we're gonna be. Where if it's and it's, none of us football guys, we could say footballers. And um, I remember I was arguing, and I said I, I don't know what I should write about. And she said there is maybe thousands of uh, uh, kids on this school, and only one of you will be a footballer. And I said, but okay, that one kid will be me then. And that's always stuck. Uh, uh, with me that I now I have said it now I need to work even how I had to train more than the others because we were maybe 15 kids just in the class that were playing football uh, so I have to do extra to be that one person you know were you that one person out of the thousand there was actually one more <laughs> and I think maybe a, a, a two others there, but they were older than us but me and uh, a guy from the from the class, uh, he's playing in, in Poland now, in uh, Krakow, um, and played in Denmark. We played together in, in Norseland as well. Um, but yeah, there was that's two professional in just my class. That's quite something. So she was wrong. <laughs> she was wrong. <laughs> or maybe if she's listening to the AFC Bournemouth podcast, then... Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a view out of her. Anyway, um, your career was, was excelling. In 2017, you were voted the Superliga Player of the Year at the Danish Football Awards. You were on fire, but you chose to leave Denmark. Was there a, a reason behind that? Did you want a new challenge? What, 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 what was it? Um, yeah, I, I, actually, I, I was signing with Brentford in the summer and I became the, the Player of the Year in that half year I had. I, I, yeah, that was where I was. Uh, scoring a lot of goals and I got uh, the award and so I already had signed with Brentford before it really took off um, but I felt that to develop and progress in my career I need to I need to go to to another country and, and uh, not because Denmark is not good enough but it's, it's just I have I think I played 125 games in Norseland um, and played on all stadiums and uh, yeah, almost scored on every stadium. So I feel like I have now I have tried it and uh, now I need to 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 take the next next step and uh, yeah try a new challenge. I think also with the culture in Denmark you are quite safe and it's a comfort zone for a lot of young players. So I try to uh, to think about okay if I need to to be the best version of myself. I truly need to do it young. And I was I was 22 at that time. 
and and thinking back uh, I even wanted to to go earlier out of of Denmark to get used to the culture in an earlier age um, and of course it ta- it's different from player to player to to get used to a new culture um, but coming from Norseland is is quite difficult because you are in in a in a club that do and the playing style is is a through the whole academy is the same and you learn how to play football that way and so when you go to another club it's totally different and and uh, that's something i have been thinking about when i got older that uh, that uh, yeah getting a new challenge earlier uh, would maybe have uh, have helped me or or made me develop another style of uh, of play um but it's it's difficult to say uh, when when the right thing is to do uh, yeah you said earlier about dreaming big were any of those dreams about playing in england did you have a in your head you know a country you wanted to go to a country you wanted to try a style you wanted to try or was it sort of the opportunity came about and you wanted to take it yeah uh, obviously as a kid you want to play in, in the premier league and and uh, la liga is uh, the two biggest and uh, that was what what I'm Uh, I was dreaming about so my choice going to to Brentford was of course to play in the Premier League and uh, um I think I have said that also in a in a few interviews uh, before that my my biggest dream is to play in the Premier League and uh I've been quite close <laughs> uh, two times the last two years so Um, that's why I also had some other options here in the summer to to go abroad and also uh, when I was playing in Norseland to go to another country. But I feel like I have I have to I have to do this first uh, before I if I go to to another country. Now I know you had a couple of injuries during your early days at Brentford, but you went back to Norseland on loan. What was the reason for that? I went to Michelin. I went to Michelin, another Danish club. Um, that is a bit uh, a bit different in the in the, yeah the style of play and of course it's, it's a bigger club with a bit more money. There's uh, the owner Matthew Benham, who is the owner of Brentford as well, um, and that was uh, a good good decision. Um, I remember Rasmus Angersen, the sports director in, in Brentford. He he was really pushing for me to go to to Michelin, but I was. I was not really happy about it because I didn't want to go back to Denmark. Um and I was actually playing in Brentford at that time but um to like re or to kickstart my my career and to get some confidence and uh some more uh continually playing time. Um I went there and and I yeah, I scored a few goals and made some assists and came back to Brentford in the winter and i was a better version of myself so it was a, a great decision uh and we were number one in in the league in in Michelin and uh, they ended up winning the league uh, so i have i have that uh, a trophy there uh, half of a trophy <laughs> um but yeah it was it was a it was a good time and a good decision and i came back to to england with with new energy and uh we went to the playoff that year as well to to play Scott Parker and and Fulham and uh yeah unfortunate for me we we lost um but uh yeah great experience now you played in Denmark you played in England what are the biggest differences between the two the biggest difference between Denmark and uh and England is um, it's a good question uh probably the in, in championship is is the is the tempo and uh yeah all the games that are coming up all the time so many games um uh, in Denmark is a bit more uh, tactically um and not so back and forth all the time it's a it's a bit more yeah tactically set pieces i would say people they there's a bit more structure in Denmark um uh yeah that's that's the biggest the bit the biggest difference i would say and then of course the culture uh here there's a lot of different cultures uh, a lot of different players from from all around the world 
and then Denmark is uh, yeah, mostly Danish players. I've got to make an apology to my podcast co-presenter there, Zoe, because the person who researched that question about you going back on loan to Norgeland to, and it was the wrong club, so we, we, we will castigate them when we find him, Zoe. I think you can just buy me a chocolate bar and we'll say we're even there. <laughs> I am sorry about that. Now, that's more than enough about football, Emmy. So let's, um, I know people can't see your tattoos. Just tell us, I know you've spoken about this before, uh, very symbolic tattoos. Just tell us what you can about what you've got. Um, yeah, I think I have, I have said it before, but it's everything is, uh, I want to have tattoos that is meaningful uh, to me. And uh, on my legs, it's only for football. So all my tattoos on my legs is, is for, for football because I play football with my legs. So um, hopefully I can get some trophies there uh, at some point. Uh, maybe um, the championship, number one in the championship. Uh, we hope for that. Uh, but yeah, my left, my left arm is, is uh, everything for my mom. Um, do you want me to, to talk about the different ones? or? Brazilian flag, a lion, and a quote. Yes. Uh, the lion is because she is a Leo in Zodiac. Um, and that's like uh, uh, courage and, and uh, gives me that symbolic of, of her. Um, quite, he, she was always brave and, and, uh, and were talking a lot about that to me, to, uh, to be... Yeah, have a lot of courage and, and be brave. And then the Brazilian flag, obviously, uh, she's from Brazil, and uh, I want to to uh, yeah, have that. It's like scratch inside my my arm, so it looks like it's underneath my skin, and that's the way I wanna uh, see it. I don't wanna forget I'm from Brazil, um, so it will always be a part of me. Um, maybe on the other arm, I will have the Danish flag at some point. Um, yeah, we, we will see. And then, what did you say? The a quote. The quote. Yeah, it's um, it says, um, "Love the light, for it shows you the way. Um, yet, love the darkness, for it shows you uh, the stars." So, it's uh, like the story with me and my my mom. Uh, as I s uh, said before, when I was taking the ball under my arm. Uh, and I went down to play football um, and they were either fighting or there was something going on and I maybe th I didn't even know about it but it was it was uh, maybe a, a bit of a dark moment um, and uh, and you know for me uh, this is to to love the darkness as well because it showed me that I have to play football and there was the way out to see the light so um, yeah that's uh, that's in, and that was always something she she said that uh, maybe it won't it doesn't look that good now but if you if you keep working and the football was the way out uh, of the dark so yeah that's a uh, that's a uh, yeah why I have that have you got anything on your legs yet about your FA Cup hat trick no <laughs> I don't I don't have uh, nah no and I. Maybe when I get a, a few more hat tricks, I'll I will have I have three thing, three fingers maybe. You've said that you <laughs> are reserving the right arm for your dad. Have yeah. you made any more progress with that yet since we last spoke? Uh, uh, no, my dad keep asking me. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. If, uh, it's actually if, I don't know why I have I have stopped. I uh, put it on pause to get any tattoos. Uh, maybe it's also because of my girlfriend. She she said I I'm not allowed to have any more any any more uh, tattoos, but uh, I think it's just uh, it's difficult also in the in the football season to get tattoos because uh, we're playing all the time and and uh, for it to heal and and to be to be nice it's I find it quite quite difficult sometimes uh, and also to to get ideas and 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 time to sit there for six hours. Uh, and it's also painful. <laughs> Who's got the best and worst tattoos in the changing room? Oh, I don't want to stitch anyone up. Uh, <laughs> but there is a few, there is a few bad ones. But 
There is actually a, a lot of good ones, and I think Morgan, he just got one. That's very nice. Uh, Jaden also got some nice ones. I would say Jaden and, and, and Morgs have, have some good ones. That's the newest one in the dressing room. Um, yeah, I, I won't say the, the worst one. Phil have a good one on his back with Kim Larsen. Uh, I like that one uh, because that's not a, 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 a thing many Danish uh, people will, will get, but he's a, a legend in, in Denmark. I think on our podcast with Ryan Christie, he almost admitted that his weren't the best. <laughs> have you seen any of them? He said that. Did he, have, he said that himself. <laughs> I, I like them. Some of the players, they, they say they don't like, but I actually like it. Uh, like small... Uh, small details and uh, yeah I, I, uh, I like it I don't think it's that bad um, some of them look a bit like a vacation you get on a vacation um, <laughs> yeah I have I have one on my leg that was also on a vacation uh, you know Ronaldinho's uh, uh, fingers um, like this phone phone hand you you make the it's uh, that one I have on my leg but that's is still symbolic for Ronaldinho, so uh, I like that. Uh, I think Ryan Christie have like this. I don't know how to describe this. Yeah, he had some symbol with his fingers, and then he was going to get a stick man on the weekend playing golf. And then there was another one about a plant pot, another one about an astronaut. Yeah. They're very random. They just sort of appear in different yeah. places in his body. Yeah, yeah. I think he have some text as well. Some it says art, and I can't remember. Well, it's like small words around his body. Uh, but I think it's I think it's nice. Well, each to their own. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> um, now, you're obviously a professional footballer. You've just admitted that you play a bit of piano. You've got a drum set. I also hear you're quite a good juggler. Is that right? Yeah. Um, yeah there was lockdown. Uh, what is it? Two years ago now. Didn't have much to do, and I didn't have a piano. And I didn't have a drum set, so I just took what I had and I start tried to juggle. And uh, but I, I was I could juggle before that, but uh, yeah, that's something I can do now. So uh, yeah, I can juggle with whatever, whatever. Just only three. Three. Yeah, only three. Well, that's that's three more than me. Um, <laughs> going back to the football now. In June 2021, you were named the PFA Community Champion. How proud did that make you? And for those people who don't quite know what that is, can you explain a little bit more about it? Yeah, it's it's not a, it's not something that I really was thinking about. There was a award for that, and uh, probably a lot of people and players they don't know there is an award because I didn't know until I got it. Um, but it is uh, about doing work uh, outside the field and in the communities, helping. Uh, where you can and uh, for me I have always felt that I I feel like uh, it's a responsibility for a football player and you are uh, you are uh, uh, in the media and you are people look up to you uh, in in football and uh, and you can you can help it's easier for for football players to help in the communities because they we have like a, a brand or, uh, um, yeah, how do you say uh, uh, there's this in the media where you are, um, you're known, you know, and uh, it's it's a uh, it's a bit easier for us to to help out. And since I was young and I coming coming through uh, the academy and I was looking up to all these uh, professional players. Uh, and and I know how it was to to get a wave or um, a signature or whatever. It made me so happy uh, as a kid. And when I came up and I was 17, so I was still a kid. But now there was kids that was looking up to me. It was it was big for me. And I I remember I always tried to use as much time. Uh, and I had a lot of time because my dad was never saying I had to come home. So. I tried to after games, after trainings, if there was kids, try out talking to them and 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 saying it, it can be you as well in in a few years because it was me uh, a couple of years ago. So I remember how it was for them, and uh, 
that's still my mindset that thinking that way that uh, it could be me outside and the people I have been helping on on some online courses where I won the award last year was was on so I, I tried to put myself in in their situation and uh, uh, yeah to to talk about the different things um, that have been with mental health as well uh, um, because we are in the end we are we are the same or we are all human and and uh, I don't put myself uh, um, above others. Now I know as well you've run campaigns on Instagram. You've you've been involved in online presentations, as you say. For you, that must, you know, when you see yourself helping other people and see yourself having an impact, that for you must, you know, be an incredibly like fulfilling feeling. Um, yeah, it does. It, it, I feel good, but also I I see it in a in another way that is not just me helping. They are also helping me and. It's like a, it's like a invest or reinvest that I help them and they help me um, becoming a, a better version of uh, of me and they become a better version of them and uh, that's that's how I try to think. I want to be more than just uh, a footballer and uh, there is also a life after football and that's something that I have been thinking about. Uh, uh, the older I, I got and and yeah especially last year with all the things going uh, going around with covid and and lockdown um and I had a few friends friends that were f- finding it difficult and so it got close to me and with my brother as well that it was difficult especially with mental health and um uh, I was saying what what can I what can I do to to help and also to help myself like investing my time because I had nothing to do uh, when I came home from training. Um, so it was like finding out where can I do something uh, that helps me progress and develop as a person and also helping other people. And um, yeah, it, it it makes me happy to develop as a person and and hopefully uh, it makes other people uh, happy as well. I mean, you said you had nothing to do when you came home from training. Do you not play computer games as well? I thought that's what footballers did. No, I don't. And uh, I have I have never really had a PlayStation. That's maybe why. Uh, so, yeah, I have I have been thinking about it actually to to get a PlayStation, but it's just like um, I think I'm so far behind now. So I will lose and lose and lose. And uh, of course, you have to. You have to start at some point uh, if you want to get to get the uh, to get better. But uh, it's like I never really got into that as a as a young as a young kid. Um, I was playing PlayStation when I was at my friends, and if I go to someone's house, then I I can I can play, but I always lose. So uh, I say I, the the excuse is I don't have a PlayStation, so I just keep saying that. Um, that's why I don't want to buy a PlayStation. So it, when, when I win, I can say I beat you, but I don't even have a PlayStation. So <laughs> how do you feel about that? <laughs> just going back to the juggling, it's not a random thing. You didn't just pick up balls and start juggling with them. There's a bit of a backstory, isn't there? There's some restaurant chain in Denmark. Were you doing it there or something? Yeah. Um, I have uh, quite a, a lot of friends that worked in Joe and the Juice, if you know that. Uh, it's also here in England. It's like a juice bar, uh, sandwich bar, and uh, yeah, I have a lot of friends that that work there. And uh, when I was younger, I always came to entertain them or uh, like stayed with them when they were working. And sometimes there's uh, it's not that busy in in the in the juice bar, so I went behind and they tried to do some skills with the ice cubes and catch. And there was like a part of the job to do that, uh, and they were allowed to do it even if there was customers. And then um, I knew I was better at juggling than them. So sometimes I was not working there, but I went uh, behind the counter and I was uh, juggling with the uh, apples or oranges. And uh, and uh, yeah, uh, some of them, they were, they were actually very good and did it with knives and everything and, uh, and ice cubes and tried to catch it with a glass and in the juice, uh, the ice cubes. So, 
Uh, fire? No, 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 no fire, no fire. Uh, but yeah, we love we we did a lot of mistakes and we had a lot of fun. Uh, and maybe uh, I shouldn't shouldn't say that when when some of them are uh, I got a bit higher up in the hierarchy and enjoyed you. So the owners more might be a bit angry, but hopefully they don't listen to 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 this podcast. Or maybe they do. Now back to the 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 charity side of you, the Right to Dream Academy. For anybody who hasn't heard of it, just explain what it's all about and how you became involved with it. Yeah, so Right to Dream Academy is uh, is uh, based in uh, Ghana, where it all started. Tom Vernon, uh, the owner, he started it uh, when he was 19 years old, I think. Uh, he went down there to Ghana with his girlfriend and uh, had a house where he took some kids in from the streets, trained them in football, and the girlfriend was teaching them uh, school things. And uh, that's how it all started. And uh, he saw a, a big um, a big potential in these kids. Um, and well, like they they have uh, they have nothing, but they they should still be having a dream. They should still have the aim to dream and the right to dream. And that's why, uh, yeah, how it all started. And then become became bigger in Ghana. And uh, yeah, now they have hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of kids in, in Ghana on the academy. And then they recruit them to FC Northland, where I played. So right to dream, they were the first academy that bought a football club. So not the other way around. Uh, the academy bought FC Norseland. Tom Vernon is now the owner of, of uh, Norseland as well. And uh, we got a lot of uh, Ghanaian players um, in Norseland. So I got a lot of teammates that was from Ghana. And uh, that was the first time I, I really uh, um, yeah, felt something, uh, a connection. Uh, with some of the the Ghanaian uh, players, uh, I remember going on a, on a training camp with with some of the players, and I I was in living with in a room with with one of the players, and he was talking about where he came from and what he had been through, and he had lost his uh, mom as well and his brother. Uh, so I felt like a a connection straight from the beginning um, on on. Uh, when when they came in with with the players, uh, uh, and then yeah, since that I have always been inspired by what what Tom Vernon have have done, and and uh, uh, yeah, try to to give that to to give back to that project uh, as well. Or, or or I will not say give back. I will say reinvest again. Again, it's not just about giving. It's also I I learn something and I develop as a person. Everyone should have the right to dream and either if you're from Ghana or there's an academy in Uganda as well that I'm that I'm uh, involved with and ambassador for and now they are doing it in Egypt as well with some new uh, uh, investors from Egypt and uh, that's where I'm I'm thinking my connection with Brazil maybe in the future that could be that could be something that I uh, like could be involved with and maybe after my career and uh, in the future there will be a, a right to dream academy in brazil that's a that's some, something i dream about uh, to to be a part of that or create that or uh, yeah to do something about that we know how tough your upbringing was emmy but you sound like you've been speaking to people who've had even tougher upbringings is that fair yeah exactly exactly and they they have been through and i have i went down to ghana uh, in the summer and i saw how it all was and that is very very tough and uh, uh, some people that haven't been to Africa uh, have maybe seen it in, in movies or in documentaries and 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 you maybe think that oh, okay they are uh, exaggerating uh, and but when you come down there it's, it, that's just how it is you know that's that's life they they sleep next to to a cow or or, or a, you know a monkey or, or whatever and that's just that's just how it is and uh, when i saw that i went to one of the villages 
with one of the FC Nordsjælland players, uh, Maxwell, that was also in Ghana, and he showed me his village there in uh, Nima, in uh, in Accra. Uh, and there was just, uh, you know, houses made of mud, and uh, and that was like here is my 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 family. They live they still live here, and and uh, they don't want to move out of here, even though he he bought a house a bit outside, a bit better place. But they they want to stay here, and that's where I lived when I was younger. And now I play in in Norseland. and uh, yeah. People that have a lot less than we have here in England and, and in Denmark, uh, they still uh, can and 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 should achieve big things. I want to ask you about your involvement with the Ugandan cherries. Obviously, we see you interacting with them on on social media. Was it sort of similar reasons as, to, as you just said as to why you want to sort of get involved and help sort of raise their profile a little bit? Um, yeah, hundred um, percent. And uh, I know another academy in Uganda called El Cambio Academy that I'm involved with in as well. And and uh, yeah, I'll try to see it in in a, to connect it. Uh, and and uh, yeah, of course, to to get more knowledge about it and to to also help where I can. And uh, it's a uh, it was very. very uh, yeah, it was right there, and they came to me. So it was, of course, I have, I, I wanna, I wanna help with this, and and also they are going on a on a tournament in Denmark. So it's it's uh, you know it's it's perfect uh, for me to be involved in, um, and uh, yeah, f- to support someone is is not even. I'm not doing all the the hard work. I'm just uh, supporting it. So that's uh, that's uh, yeah, very very easy. F- uh, for me just to say, of course, I, I want to be involved in that. Now, for supporters who don't know, on a match day, after a game, a lot of food is brought down to the change room for the players after the game to have both both teams. Now, before Christmas, after a game, you were seen leaving the stadium with trays of leftover food that the players had left. Just tell us a bit more about where you were taking them and, and what you were doing. Um, yeah, uh, there is a lot of food and we have a lot of nice food. Uh, in the dressing room, and uh, um, I have I have been asking some of the chefs what do we do, and also here at the training ground where after we we eat, uh, what do we do with all the leftovers? Do we just throw it out? Um, and I I think it's because of my upbringing, my dad was always like, you have to eat everything. We we're gonna eat, it, we're gonna throw it out. We cannot throw it out, and we're gonna save it for tomorrow. And if we can't save it, you have to eat it, you know. So, I think that's that's just how I am. Um, so I always think like that. So uh, after the game, I can't even remember what game it was, but I've been thinking about a lot of the games, and uh, especially here around Christmas, um, that I have been helping in Denmark as well when I uh, when I was playing there uh, in Christmas time because the last few years I haven't really celebrated Christmas. So I went with my Muslim uh, friend in Denmark that uh, obviously doesn't doesn't celebrate Christmas. We went to a homeless shelter in Denmark and uh, were like serving food. Uh, and uh, I was thinking about that in December, in early December. I was like, okay, what can I do here in, in Bournemouth? Is there uh, is there like a homeless shelter? And I was searching on on uh, on the internet and I found this YMCA uh, Bournemouth homeless shelter um, and I texted them and, and saying uh, what kind of help do you need here in the winter and do you do any uh, events or that that can bring some support and they had an event where there was uh, raising money where there was a singer as well and uh, yeah I brought the food uh, for for the homeless uh, for that day it was a Saturday I can't remember. Maybe you can remember the game, but was it Blackburn? Does. Am I right in thinking it was Blackburn yeah, at home maybe. just before Christmas? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're probably right. Um, so I went there to the YMCA uh, center in in this in central of of Bournemouth with with all the food and you know we get sushi and we have really nice chicken skewers and uh, wraps, uh, chicken wraps and uh, I I remember one of the 
one of the guys in, in the shelter, he said, I don't think we have ever had uh, sushi before. <laughs> God, uh, someone delivers sushi. So uh, that was quite quite nice to, a nice feeling uh, and a response to get. Yeah, it, it must have been amazing and a, a brilliant thing to do. Now, going back to the football, or sort of going back to the football, a few days before the playoff final, you were wandering around looking like Freddie Mercury. Yeah. You can see a smile on your <laughs> face. <laughs> Do you want to expand on that a little uh, bit more? Yeah, that was. Uh, yeah, it was. It was crazy. That 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 moment uh, was the day before or two days before the game. I got a elbow in my face, so I thought that was it. That was me the, for this season. Um, I lost one tooth and a half of the other front tooth. So. Uh, yeah, I looked very bad, and uh, my lip was very swollen, and I couldn't couldn't really talk. Um, but I went straight in, straight in, and uh, we got a dentist appointment straight away. And uh, yeah, uh, thank thank to him, he he completely ripped his uh, all his appointments out of out of the system for me. So uh, yeah i st- still owe him uh, a big uh, thanks uh, for that but uh, he got it fixed and i got a temporary teeth uh, tooth up and uh, half of a temporary one and uh, yeah it was it was all right but it was not perfect but it, it was i could i could uh, smile on the photos with the trophy afterwards without uh, looking like freddie mercury so uh, in the end it was it was all good were you singing "We Are the Champions" after the final? <laughs> yeah, I should. I should have taken my tooth out and then be singing that. Now, people can't see you on this podcast, Emmy, but you've turned up wearing a woolly black hat. We can't actually yeah. see your hair. Now, I want to ask you about your hair because mm-hmm. you haven't been here that long. We've seen you have it short. We've seen you have it long. We've seen you have it tied back. We've seen it curly, braided, blonde, and dark. What? What do you wake up one day and decide you're going to change it or what? Um, well, yeah, I don't really know what to answer. It's, I think it's just a part of me. It's like I want to try new things, and I, uh, I wake up sometimes and I think, oh, I look, I look a bit, it look boring. I, just, I want to change, you know, and uh, I think uh, I don't want to be be old and think oh, I should have tried something with my hair and uh, you know I want to as, as soon as I'm young and I, it probably s- keeps me young as well to try different things and uh, when I'm looking back on pictures as well I'm like oh that was the time I had uh, braids and or I had white hair at that time and it's like give me a perspective of my career so when I had the white hair I was playing in Michelin and when I had my braids, I was in uh, in Brentford or whatever. So it's it's like giving me a, a a timeline. It feels like I have had a, a longer life, in, or a, some of the years feels longer, because I think times happen so quickly and uh, times go so quickly. So for for me, it feels like I'm trying to extend the the time of 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 living by by doing that, because hair. Yeah, uh, grows and uh, a lot of people just keep the same hair for for their whole life and I I find that a bit boring sometimes that it's, it's just the same and you have the same look uh, your whole life but um, at some point I also have to uh, my girlfriend said I have to be a bit more uh, decisive or a bit more mature to just keep the same hair God, she likes my hair right now so right now I'm not cutting it uh, I'm saying I'm not cutting it before we end the prem. So hopefully we're gonna promote this uh, this year. You mess about with it too much, you might start falling out. <laughs> yeah, some some uh, some of my friends they say that you you're gonna fall off soon. You're not gonna be thirty, and you're gonna have you're gonna be bald. So no, I think I have good genes with that. My my mom had uh, long curly hair, very very thick hair. So. I think I got that from from her, so hopefully it will it will stay. When you first moved to Bournemouth here, I remember you saying how much you had missed nature, living in London. Just tell us about the differences between 
living, I don't know where you lived in London, but living in London and living in Bournemouth? Yeah, it's just a, it's just a bit more space, spacious. In London, everything is compact and uh, I think it's also the people. There's so many people, so much uh, stress, I feel. I don't feel stressed, but I feel like everyone has something to do and everyone have an agenda going somewhere or they have to do something and they they are business orientated uh, which is also good in in some sense but um and i got some connections from living in london but um i like it a bit more chilled here it, it reminds me a bit more of denmark um that yeah the traffic also you know it's it's just a bit more smooth and you don't have to stop and start and stop and start and you know uh, in london it can be quite uh, stressful especially when now when i go to london my girlfriend she lives in, in london still and when i go there is uh, it reminds uh, or i get reminded of okay it's, it was very hectic when i you know when i was here but i just got used to it and uh, now when i have seen it from far away and 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 been there i I see the 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 benefits of the that is it's a better life to to have uh, a bit more relaxed. Oh, I like it more like that. Emmy, if ever you want to get stuck in traffic, just go to Christchurch. You can get stuck in traffic <laughs> there every day, okay. every week. I assure you. <laughs> now, um, <clears throat> excuse me. You're capped by Denmark. Have been capped every level between under seventeen right up to under twenty one. Do you still harbour hopes of winning a senior cap? Yeah, of course, of course. And uh, um, yeah, now we were talking about tattoos before and the Danish flag. Uh, and maybe when I get that Denmark cap, I will get a, a Danish flag. Um, so yeah, of course, I dream about playing for the national team. Um, I know there's a lot of good players. Uh, and I think really Denmark are, are pushing uh, big time at the moment uh, with a lot of good players doing well outside of Denmark uh, probably the best they have ever done um, and I'm I'm just I'm happy to be I'm proud to be Dane and uh, Dane be from Denmark and, and around all these I know, and I know a lot of a lot of these players playing from the national team and, and doing well uh, so um yeah, I think there's a big future for for Denmark, and uh, it's like uh, all the, the the talent are getting better and better. And I think the the work that are done in, in Denmark in the clubs are are paying off now. And uh, um, yeah, big future ahead. And you were on the terraces in the Euro semi-final as well. Is that true? Yeah, I, I was. Uh, I was at Wembley um, watching that game, and and I saw my my. Uh, one of my students scored a free kick goal. Uh, so that was a, a big moment uh, for Denmark and for Mikkel Damsko, who scored the free kick. And uh, yeah, I was, I was very, uh, I was actually touched by that goal um, because he was one of my first student, student in my free kick, uh, free kick school. Uh, not that I, I say because of me, he scored that free kick, but uh, we have been practicing a lot of shooting together and uh, yeah, me, uh, him and uh, Andreas Gård Olsen and Matthias Jensen, who play in Brentford now, uh, we're always uh, doing a lot of finishing after training. Just add your free kick masterclass, you haven't really explained to people what that's all about. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, very simple, it's, it's, um, it's a free kick uh, masterclass where I, I, I train and I try to give my expertise to, to young kids and uh, and uh, yeah, I've done it in, in Denmark and in Ghana and uh, yeah I try to also have at, at some point some uh, event here maybe in Bournemouth and uh, maybe you can help me with that. Um, I've heard Neil takes a good free kick so yeah. get him involved. I'm more of a tap-in <laughs> yeah. merchant me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah I've try, tried to, to, to uh, teach the technique of, of, uh, of a free kick is something I have always practiced a lot and uh, I want to do more of. Now a bit more of a curveball question. I hear you're very good at table tennis. 
Would that be fair to say? Um, I'm not. I'm not very, very good. Uh, I think Jaden is. He's he's playing a bit more than me, and then um, I think he's he's probably one of one of the best now. But I will maybe put my myself in two or or, or, or three in the team. Um, I have a table tennis in my garden, but now it's too cold to play, so I haven't played for yeah three months or something. Um, but I would say I'm 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 all right here. Yeah. So all right at table tennis, not bad at the piano. Do you have any other hidden talents that we need to be aware of here? Well, it's not it's not real talent. It's not real. It's, you know, it's not. I haven't taken to that perfect or not perfect, but good level yet. Um, and I don't know if if I ever would will, um, but I just trying to, uh, yeah, trying to do a lot of things um, and be, as I said, be better at, at or be more skillful at, at anything really. Um, yeah, I think when I when I put something in my head, then I then I'm trying to do it, and I I'm not I don't stop before I I can do at least something. You know, I will. Uh, yeah, try to to do it uh, to a certain degree. When the weather was a bit nicer in the summer, you were spotted riding an electric scooter down the beach. Who? Is that something you'd had? Who saw me? Well, I, I can't <laughs> reveal my source, but um, but no, tell us about that. You've got an electric scooter, and I think you perhaps used it to come in, into training a couple of times. Is that something that you got when you were down here by the beach? Is that something you've always had? Is it something no. that you sort of just thought would be a bit of fun? Yeah, I, I I didn't have a car, uh, and I was living in the hotel, and I was thinking, uh, how do I get to training? And uh, and uh, you know there was a lot of I tried to get a deal, but it was a car deal, but it was quite difficult just to get a car straight away, and uh, they were also quite expensive uh, the deals. So I I bought an electric scooter instead, and uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think I went on a walk and you, there is these you can rent uh, in the park, in Bournemouth Park, and uh, I saw that and uh, I was like, why don't I buy my own and just take that to training? It takes 15 minutes. I went through the park and then it's a beautiful uh, ride all the way down uh, on the pier. And uh, yeah, I thought I would maybe just do it for one or two weeks, but then uh, I was like, this is, this is working perfect. Uh, I'm saving money and uh, it's a beautiful and I uh, a beautiful ride and I enjoy it. So um yeah, that's that's how it ended and then uh of course on rainy days I had to take a cap but uh otherwise it was it was uh, yeah, very good in the summer. You've got a fascination with fast cars. Tell us about that. A fascination. Fa- yeah, you you like fast cars is it because you said if you could swap with any other sports person it would be Lewis Hamilton ah yeah that's true that is true but I don't have a fast car at the moment uh, but I like I like go-karting um, and uh, yeah when when we go go-karting I I win most of the times <laughs> uh, I actually have a trophy at home for winning in go-kart in, in Brentford um, but yeah, I like I like speed and also like Tour de France. Uh, it's a big thing in, in Denmark as well. And I, I used to to go on a bike as well, uh, racing on bicycles or go karting. So, and I like to watch Formula One. So that's that's uh, yeah, that's I like I like speed. You uh, you didn't think about getting a tattoo of your your go karting trophy on your leg? <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's not you don't win that with your legs, do you? That's very true. It's not that you drive with your hands, or so yeah, maybe. If you had have swapped places with Lewis Hamilton, how would you have felt about losing the Grand oh, Prix the way he did? Devastating. It was. Um, yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I don't know what to say about that because it was. It was so. It was not for me. It was not sport. It was. It was just uh, based on a decision, and you know. That's what I don't like about Formula One. That is, you know, this this uh, team that is uh, deciding what to to do and go in, in in laps, and now they can overtake, and now they can't overtake, and so that's that's maybe a, a bit uh, what I don't like about Formula One, and also 
it's a it's a lot of money in that sport. So for for people with not a lot of money can't really go come into that sport. Um and that's also why I like Lewis Hamilton, because he's he's been just working hard and working his way all the way through. Um and uh but it, for for him to to react how he did in that moment was was top professional and I don't think he have he have got uh, enough praise for that because I think a lot of other sportsmen they w- they would have re- reacted differently. Um, yeah, he's he's a he's a true winner in in my eyes. I have to ask you. You say you haven't got a fast car at the moment. I think it's a little polo out there, isn't it? It's it, a golf. A golf. There yeah. we go. Well, it must be a a contrast in the car park to uh, to some of the Range Rovers. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I get a lot of. Uh, from that as well from from the other players <laughs> because it's it's my girlfriend's car and uh yeah she she had a car that was uh just uh just standing because she was standing at her, her mom's home because she don't want to drive in london she's uh, a bit scared to drive with all the traffic and uh and i was on my scooter every day and and some days i came home and i was all wet because when i I went to training, it was sunny, and I came home, and then it was raining, and she was in the hotel room there. Uh, why are you all wet? And I have to change and ask her to to wash my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and then she was like, why, you need to get a car? And I said, but yeah, it's, it's expensive. And, uh, and then she said, yeah, I have a car. I said, what, why, why can't I use that? Just until I, I find a new one. And then she said, okay, that's, you can do that. And then now I just, it's saving me money. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, how, how I also see it. It's, uh, it's uh, a win-win. A win-win. Now, you've enjoyed six months here at the club, just over that. You recently got your first career hat-trick, as we've alluded to earlier. After that game against Yeovil, we did the interview pitch side, and you said you didn't know what you were going to do with your match ball. You said you might use it in the garden, for a kick around, you might use it on the table tennis table. You, you weren't sure. What what have you done with it? Have you done anything with it? Um, no, it's too cold to play in the garden right now. So right now it's just on uh, on my like uh, trophy cabinet uh, in the living room. Uh, yeah, so I have to wait to play with it until it's a bit warmer. Now, just finally before we jump into some fan questions. What are your sort of hopes and ambitions for the rest of the season? I think that's probably one big goal for the for the squad here. It is to score as many hat tricks as possible. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, of course the 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 yeah main thing is to for us to get a promotion, and um, that's yeah everything I I uh, and we we think about and, and push for, uh, but also to take every day as. As, as it is and every game as it is because um, that's how you progress and develop um, and as I have been spoken, uh, talking about a lot uh, getting better every day developing your skills is that's how I see it and, and just enjoy the moment enjoy the ride yeah just before we do the questions I want to ask you Emmy where do you what would you be doing when you're 50 years old what would you hope to be doing 50 um I would like to uh, run an academy. Yeah, have some have uh, a lot of kids that uh, are playing uh, football, hopefully, <laughs> and uh, yeah, run a run an academy maybe in Brazil. Um, yeah, that would be that would be lovely. Now that we are going to finish off with these fan questions, we've got about five that have been been submitted that we've selected from social media we're going to fire through them quite quickly so we'll start with Lynn who submitted hers on Twitter you seem to go out of your way to engage with the fan base is that important to you to have that connection yeah I think uh, the fans are everything you know in football the fans are everything if if, if there's no fans a football club cannot run uh, so for for me the fans is everything and and uh, I started as a football fan, so I have been on the sides, uh, on the on the stands, and uh, um, I remember still today. I remember those players who who spend a bit more time and and were answering questions or 
giving a bit a uh, little wave or a, a signature or a shirt or whatever so that's still the players i i remember so that's that's one i what i try to do as well morgan again on twitter wants to know what's your favorite goal that you scored this season there's a few to choose from um my favorite goal is um, maybe yeah the first one in yeovil i think Great ball from Meps, uh, but also because we've just been training that uh, the whole week. A ball, ball over the top, get a good first touch, and uh, yeah, put it, put it in the back of the net. Sam on Twitter says you've been here a while. Have you settled in well with the lads? Yeah, yeah, I think I think uh, uh, I've settled in quite well, uh, and it's a very good squad. Very easy. Uh, to get uh, get into and uh, a lot of uh, different per- personalities but uh, it fits everyone fits quite well in in, in the dressing room uh, and also with the new lads coming in it's uh, for me it's, it's quite easy to to see how 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 good the squad are now also when i have been here for half a year and i see new players coming in uh, that we have we have a a very very good squad that are um, very good around each other. Juliet on Facebook, do you have any pets? No, I have never had any pets. Um, but I love dogs and I yeah I love animals actually. But I, I've never had uh, any pets. I think uh, you have to be dedicated to to an animal, and they probably I will use too much time on that. I and I don't have that that much. Ryan on Facebook is he's probably asking on behalf of the entire AFC Bournemouth supporter base. Are we getting promoted? Yes, we are, hundred percent. Well, there we go, Ryan. Em- Emiliano Marcondes has spoken. <laughs> well, Emmy, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here with us today. We've absolutely loved your company and hearing about your fascinating life story. So thank you very much for, for joining us. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Now, if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast, then we would absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you are listening on. We'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, be it AFC Bournemouth related or just the general football fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Emiliano Marcondes and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle, thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast.